Our next speaker is uh, Jenny Clegg. Um, uh, Jenny Clegg is an in independent writer and researcher, former senior lecturer of, uh, in international studies and longtime China specialist. She's also the author of an important book, China's Global Strategy Towards a Multipolar World, which was published in 2009. She's an activist also in the peace and anti-war movements. So Jenny, please go ahead. Thanks, Radhika. Um, yeah, rereading the manifesto, we can see, I think, a very strong sense of being on the brink of a momentous historical change. Uh, nevertheless, the turn of events over the Ukraine conflict blindsided many and uh, giving much pause for thought. Um, I've been looking again at uh, pluripolarity and multipolarity. Uh, pluripolarity sees a variety of states, from imperialist to socialist, arising state by state from the contradictory processes of uneven and combined development as external conditions interact on internal class dynamics. But the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, what's important is the overall configuration of power, which sets out a strategic terrain with patterns of interstate contradiction and coordination, which change as the underlying balance of power shifts. Multipolarity captures the shift from US hegemony towards a five-pole pattern of the EU, Japan, Russia and China, as well as the United States, which since February the 24th, the US has dramatically sought to reverse, damaging Russia, subordinating the EU and Japan in readiness to turn directly to China. Pluripolarity and multipolarity are complementary, but the latter, I think, opens up wider directions and future scope. A game of go playing different parts of the board rather than a chess game of head-on confrontation between two state players. I also would now distinguish between a multipolarity in itself and a multipolarity for itself. A multipolarity in itself, the objective conditions, involves other states, likely strong rising regional powers, moving in with their own agendas to build or defend national strength where they perceive a vacuum left by US decline. Multipolarity for itself, the subjective conditions, involves conscious, a conscious process. Rather than a series of uncoordinated national agendas, it involves a coordinated developmental effort, which at once searches out opportunities to gradually undermine hegemonism, while shaping through trial and error, alternative arrangements to try and find the way to win without fighting. It's not for nothing, I think, that China consistently embraces the notion of the present era as one of peace and development. It does so by keeping the whole game of go in view and looking to the long term, calculating possible moves ahead. I think that the manifesto now needs to bring the strategic element more into focus, the issues of war and peace, the crucial importance of the UN coming out of two world wars as a radical turning point in the path of capitalist development with its recognition of national sovereignty and equality, opening the door to multipolarization. Nor should we forget how the peace movements of the 1980s and the international opposition to the Iraq war also formed poles in the emerging multipolarity, influencing the strategic balance. And right now, of course, the urgency of the struggle for peace and nuclear disarmament. I also want to say something about neoliberalism. The manifesto shows very clearly how this lies at the root of the current malaise. But when we see how the US is now using bullying and economic coercion to restructure the energy and arms markets, to control and monopolize new technologies, as well as weaponizing finance, is neoliberalism still the correct term? And right now in Britain, as crisis deepens, divisions in the Tory party are like cats on a hot tin roof, surely reflecting differing fractions of capital. And there are strategic issues here, I think, which neoliberalism as a general term does not really capture. And finally now, 
IMG seeks to celebrate and to explain the real achievements of socialism. But the history of socialism is also full of mistakes and some terrible mistakes. IMG then uh, must uh, not be too generalizing, but must maintain a critical perspective. It must encourage debate and allow nuances to be explored in a respectful way, whether in addressing the non-aligned trend, the dualities of the U Ukraine war, and indeed of Putin himself. Sectarianism is the bane of the left, and Mao Zedong saw doctrinarism and dogmatism as the worst of all errors. IMG should aim to be a broad forum of anti-imperialist and socialist discussion and should avoid taking partisan positions which would squander its opportunities to build bridges of dialogue between anti-imperialists in the global north and global south. Going forward uh, from my own context in Britain, socialist demands are conflating into calls for nationalization seem to exist in a vacuum detached from anti-imperialism and the international context. How to link the cost of living protests and calls for a ceasefire and peace negotiations over Ukraine, uh, it seems uh, the biggest challenge that we face. Internationally, I think we also need to take account of contradictions within counter hegemony and within the global south. And lastly, to return to the question of internal and external, Towards the end of the document, the manifesto talks about advances towards socialism in the near future involving international struggle as much as domestic class struggle. And it then says the key is seizing control of the state from capital, that is on a state to state basis. Um, how do these two aspects of the international and the domestic fit together? And in relation to the six points at the end, um, how do these play out internationally as well as domestically? And here, I think that China's initiatives on global development and global security deserve our particular attention. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and ones like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.